coming to you live from Fanafa Studios, Coco Memlokra, on DSTV Channel 421 and Grove TV Channel 144. You can join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We are Joy News on TV and this is Joy News. Coming up, heavy security presence in Nima after a violent clash between rival youth groups there leaves one person with gunshot wounds and several others injured. We have details plus business, world news and showbiz all in this hour. Stay with us. Security has been beefed up in Nima after yesterday's afternoon's clash between rival youth groups there. A group of young men went on rampage attacking each other with machetes amid gunshots. Here is how it all happened. The police has since arrested seven suspects in connection with the incident, leaving many others on the run. One person who sustained gunshot wounds is currently on admission. The police described the incident as a feud between rival youth groups in the community, which escalated Tuesday afternoon. Director General of the Ghana Police Service Public Affairs ACP Chris Yofor, has been providing details. He assures that the service has got the matter under control. He spoke at a press conference last night. Nima, a suburb of Accra, witnessed gangsterism and mass violence around 3.30 p.m. and the police quickly and immediately intervened by this engaging that violence. The violence was so the violence spread across some sections of Nima and the intervention force have to manage the situation carefully. They managed to stabilize their situation. Seven people have been arrested. Five are presently here with us. And the other two are on admission under police guard. That suggests they are under arrest. Again, we are pursuing the criminals in and around Nima and its environs to make sure that we get them arrested to enable them to face justice. And the gang gangsterism that I spoke about is led by Wan Kumoji, alias Ibrahim Hussein, and Bombo, alias Ali Aoud. They are rivalry groups that never agreed on issues. And today they went all out on the open street of Nima. We would like the media to know that the police has taken charge of the situation and we have made that violence in the bad. We are in control and we would like to let the good people of Nima no, that the police will be there at all times to protect life and property. And that will not give room for such criminals to disturb the peace and security of Nima. As I said, those arrested will be subjected to thorough investigations and those found culpable will be prosecuted according to the laws of the land. The police administration also would like to make it clear that it will not sit down on consent for such hoodlums, criminals, to take our streets and deploy violence. Again, we also like to say that we've retrieved some important items, clues and evidence on the street, notably some spent ammunition, some ammunition, and 
adapted implement to come cause harm and injury. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, our exercise to maintain general stability law and order in the NEMA environs continues. And that exercise is ongoing under the headship of the Director General Police Operations and the Accra Regional Commander. So by tomorrow morning, the media again will be updated on issues pertaining to our ops. One victim also identified as Apia, who was shot during the incident, is currently responding to treatment at the 37 military hospital. My colleague Manor Kronsing visited the community this morning and reports that there's heavy security presence. He spoke to an eyewitness. Anybody would oh, yesterday I was in my shop, then I hear a gunshot, but I don't know where the gunshot from. After I realized, I raised my head top, I see the gunshot in my single shop. It's not a gunshot in your ceiling? Uh, but I don't know who, but the gunshot is from the top there. The top there, mom will be top. Then I hear the gunshot. That's from the side? From there into my shop street. I do not wake up. Once I saw that thing, then I wake up and do what? And close my shop and run out. You ran out? I ran out. What did you run through? Because uh, this, this, you say it was coming from here. And it's from the top there. I'm scared because you can... Now look into the camera. You said you were scared. Yeah, that's why I run. I ran away. I don't want to stay. Can you, can you show me, can you show me the gunshot uh, marks on your, on your shop? Yeah. Where's the shop? Okay, well, we, we, I think we can walk to his um, shop just briefly and, you know, just catch a glimpse of exactly what um, he's telling us. He says that um, there were gunshots uh, which were fired um, right through um, his face and it went all the way into his shop. So this is your shop? Yeah. Okay, so you're going to show me now um, what, what, what happened. Okay, so wh where's, the, where's the mark? Okay, so that's the mark there. That's the mark here. From here. Came back to here. Okay. Come back to next top. Then you went out. So I can count four different holes um, right through the ceiling and all um, are you know perpendicular like that all through the space uh, in the roof there. Yeah. So number one is this. Two is this. Came back. Okay, so he's just uh, now, now showing me. And in fact, there are more holes, um, which are just, you know, uh, emerging right from the roof there. And so, Haruna, this is your shop. And so, how did you escape? Because I opened the bag there. There is some wood I covered there. I opened the bag and passed there. I can't pass the door and get out. So today you've not opened the shop? No, because I'm scared maybe something must happen today too. I don't know. People on the ground. But it seems... Everybody is caught by surprise. I mean, nobody seems to know what is going on. And I was just going to ask that, could we have seen this coming? Absolutely, because usually before something like this happens, it might have simmered for, for some time now. Unfortunately, uh, the security services might have their attention tilted elsewhere. But if there was proper intelligence on the ground, we could have, as a matter of fact, seen it coming before it blew up in our face. But... Currently, it looks like people don't really want to talk. And it's very inconsistent with what I know about Zongos. I mean, you touch one person in Zongo, you touch all of Zongo. There is that unity, that fraternity within the Zongo community. And it's quite surprising that um, we have, you know, uh, gangs fighting 
I don't know over what uh, within within the Zongo area. So I'm quite surprised and taken but, aback. But, but you've seen the security deployment here. Um, you, you don't think that is coming in a bit too late, as you're saying. Um, if there was, uh, you know, um, 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 effective, you know, intelligence, we might have seen this coming. But now we're seeing the deployment on the ground. This also works well, no? Well, um, it's, it's just an uh, interim initial measure but of course this doesn't solve anything and i'm particularly excited that the police has shown um, interest in what is happening yesterday i followed the news conference and the you know assurances by the police i feel it's quite satisfying um, the boots on the ground we're seeing is also sending a clear message to the people within the area that hey we are still in charge and we're not going to allow this to happen but i'm hoping that going forward we make a conscious attempt to get all of those involved and make sure they are held account into account okay or accountable i should put it um so we are able to nip in the bud that cycle of impunity that is making people feel that once you are in the zongo you are beyond reproach and nobody can hold you to account uh secondly we have to collaborate progressively with uh, the various stakeholders on the ground particularly through the chief imam's office and of course, personalities such as Papa Angola, who garner a lot of respect um, and recognition within the Zongo community, so that the next time, if there's anything like that going to happen, we would have people willingly giving out information so we are able to prevent it. And on the other hand, if in case it happens, they would make sure the police gets those uh, responsible. My colleague Manuel Cranton joins me on the phone with more. Uh, Manuel, do we know what really caused the clash? Manuel, do we know it, what really it, caused the uh, clash? It, it, it might have been a tear for what we are told by residents um, who have actually uh, monitored uh, the situation and, in fact, reports to us that this is not the first time that an incident is happening. Uh, say that the, the, the two field factions. Um, have essentially been, uh, you know, fighting over who commands the territorial presence within the Nima area. I uh, was told that uh, yesterday and the day before, one of the leaders of this particular two factions entered into the other's uh, territory or purported territory. He was confronted uh, by the others, and then he also uh, called for reinforcement as it will be uh, from his squad. And that is what escalated into the clashes that uh, we saw yesterday at at Nima. Uh, and so that, that is essentially what we've, we've been able to gather from the grounds as regarding uh, what might have triggered this particular situation. All right, thank you very much for that update. So that's my colleague Manuel Kranting reporting live from Nima. Let's move on to other stories where two children have been giving a chilling account of how a herdsman allegedly butchered their 15-year-old brother in front of them at Nshiaso, a small farming village in the Asante Achim North Municipality of the Ashanti region. The unidentified cattle herder, according to the children, accosted them at a water source and inflicted machete wounds on the boy, killing him instantly. The villagers searched the area minutes later and arrested three herdsmen and handed them over to the Agogo police. The indigents are calling for a government intervention to prevent a resurgence of an age-old conflict between the community and herdsmen. Love Femmes Arasas Asari Donko was in the community and now reports. In Shiaeso is a farming community with a long history of herdsmen cattle invasion of farms. But Monday's butchering of 15-year-old David Anaria has shocked the entire community. What was supposed to be a daily chore of fetching water with their elderly sibling turned bloody. So this is the water source for both the grazing cattle for the Fulani herdsmen and farmers who farm around this area. Now this is where the crime was allegedly committed. I have here the two children who have come back to the scene uh, to pick their footwear and they're going to tell us what actually happened. Mm. And he points to that tree over there. 
So at the point where he was about to, you know, carry the gallon of water which is still lying here, he said that the headsman got up from his seat from there again and came back here. This time he drew uh, his machete and came towards him. At this point, his brother was begging him to forgive him if he has done anything wrong. <laughs> At this point, the herdsman was butchering the boy, and he says that he was shouting that people should come and rescue him. So he tells me that they ran, and at a point in time, he told his brother that they should uh, part ways so that they would not be caught. And so he took another ten, and the brother took another ten. He went home to tell his people. Their father, Anaria, is distraught. The way I've suffered to raise this boy, he was supposed to write his final exams next year. The law should deal with these Fulani people. The killing is raising fears of the return of herdsmen to the area. You fought, uh, not very long, panic. Panic, because you, you see, all people, all, 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 all the people here, we are farmers. This time we, we, we are gathering our, our crops and they will come destroying them. Destroying them, even if you, you tell Abuchi, don't, don't do all. What is this? And, and then if we don't calm down, trouble. So we fear even today to, to, to go to the farm. We don't know whether they have been hiding over there. School has reopened, but who will send his child to come? How do you know if the child will come back safely? We were expecting the police and military to be here today to offer protection and to drive these people away so we can go back to our normal duties. Police have since been visiting communities urging calm. Inspector Bodhi was seen addressing the community. Please, we urge you to send your grievances to the police. Don't take the law into your own hands. Meanwhile, three suspects arrested in connection with a killing are receiving treatment at the Agogo Hospital after a near lynching incident. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaredonko, and Shaeso Asantiachem North, Ashanti region. Compensation packages proposed for victims and families of victims of the 2005 state sponsored massacre of Ghanaians in the Gambia have been rejected. The Gambian authorities, under the Truth, Reconciliation and Repatriation Commission, proposed over 600 thousand US dollars to be paid to victims and their families through their respective governments. But the Jama 2 Justice Coalition seeking justice for the 67 Ghanaians and other West African nationals who fell victims to the killing say the amount is woefully inadequate. Ohimitaria of a security desk has more. At least 44 Ghanaians and their counterparts who wanted to use the Gambia as a transit point to enter Europe for greener pastures were allegedly killed by military officers linked to the then Gambian dictator Yaya Jamel, an account by Ghanaian Martin Tre, who escaped the attack, led to the investigations, including ones led by ECOWAS and UN teams. A Truth, Reconciliation and Reparation Commission set up by the Gambian government in its report indicted ex-military ruler Yaya Jamel and 13 others including military officers for state-sanctioned massacre. The report 
recommended prosecution of the actors for leading extensive state manufactured cover up campaign. It concludes that Yaya Jame is responsible for the killings and for disappearance and torture of more than 67 West African migrants by giving direct orders to the Jangers to summarily execute them in July 2005. Yaya Jame is also responsible for subsequently organizing and coordinating to the state apparatus under his command and control, a massive and systematic cover-up campaign in order to exonerate himself from responsibility for these crimes. Pending a government white paper in the Gambia, the commission recommended the payment of a total sum of $604,000 to victims and their families. Coordinator of Jamel to Justice Coalition, William Nyakon told a news conference Portions of the Commission's recommendations are welcomed, but findings fell short of expectations. From the Jamaica Justice uh, campaign, campaign uh, first of all, uh, we thank the TRC for not only validating uh, some of our own findings, but also having the courage to uh, issue this report, which found uh, Yaya Jame and 13 others criminally liable. Uh, we accept these findings uh, with regard to the accountability. Uh, we also uh, are grateful for the other uh, consequential recommendations that have been made. We, however, are uh, disappointed in the amount. We think that the Gambian government or to ensure that this amount is, is increased. Speaking on behalf of victims and their families, the sole survivor, Martin Tre, said only compensation in the region of 15 million US dollars will be accepted. Talking about uh, uh, the compensation is, 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 is not something which is acceptable to our, the, the families, those here in Ashanti region and those in Bono Afo and those in Eastern region and Western region and Accra, they are not acceptable. So we are imagining the government of Gambia to increase the amount, the compensation that, that the families may be well accepted so that uh, the matter will be put to rest. We, we want to see something like $50 million as compensation. The coalition has appealed to the Gambian president Adam Mabaru to fast track implementation of the Commission's report from Kumasi or Interior reporting. The Sakumono Complex 2 primary has converted its library and community lab into classrooms for KG 1 and 2 pupils. The school lost its KG department to fire during the COVID-19 lockdown period. The new space is very congested as a result of the swelling numbers brought on by new enrollment as school reopens. Joy News' Mausi Newmon visited the school and came through with this report. There are about 60 people in the newly converted classroom for KG peoples. Both library and computer lab space put together should originally accommodate just one class. That is currently not so because of the fire incident. The bent classroom is yet to be rehabilitated. Headmistress of the school and Rita Newton gave details account of the incident to Joy News. It's supposed to be our KG, our KG1 and KG2 building. During the lockdown, we, the place got bent. Yeah, we had electrical issue and then during the lockdown it got bent. We are managing with our library for the time being. Yeah, that is where we are hosting the KG2 and then our ICT labs, we are using it for the KG1. So that is where we are, only that the place is congested. She is therefore appealing to government and corporate organizations to come to their aid. Though the municipal, they promised that as soon as possible, they will come and then renovate the whole place for us. We are just hoping anybody out there that can also come to our aid we will be happy. As the new academic year begins, parents are anxious of securing admission for their children. But that is not certain yet, particularly for these enrolling in schools for the first time. School authorities, however, say they are expecting more approaches for possible enrollment. 
Meanwhile, Deputy Education Minister John Intim Fodjob, who was at the school to welcome the newly enrolled pupils, urged parents to take advantage of the right of enrollment and free education to put their children in school. We are encouraging all stakeholders, particularly parents, to encourage their children. No child must be left behind. We want to ensure that in, as part of efforts to attain the tenets of Sustainable Development Goal 4, we have, we have quality and equitable access to quality education for all. And every child, regardless of their disability, regardless of their socioeconomic background, must all have access to quality education. So today we welcome here at Sakumano Complex 1 and 2 and to all the kids that are reporting to school in all the system regions of this country, we welcome you and we assure you that a bright and solid education system awaits you and that as you progress through, you will be the future leaders, you will be the future teachers, future lawyers, the future men and women who are going to contribute strongly and significantly to nation building. The future of this country lies in the hands of the ones that we are welcoming to school today. We on our part as government, as Ministry of Education, we will do all that we can to ensure that we attain some of the highest standards the world has seen in education. We ensure that we resort to education as a, a credible strategy for rapid social economic transformation. Greater Accra Regional Director of Education, Monica Ankara, also encouraged teachers to discharge their duties in spite of challenges saddling their air force. To give up their best, but they have to give back to society what society has done for them, to nurture, help and assist and appreciate whatever government is doing. The children are our own. They also have their children in school, so they have to work hard to make sure that they give them the best education that they could so that they become responsible citizens in the near future. Yeah, Rome was not built in one day, so definitely there will be challenges. But despite the numerous challenges, they should give up and then continue to nurture those young ones so that the good Lord will bless them all. Maosi Numos report for Joy News. A study carried out by the Department of Chemistry at Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology has revealed as high as 50% increase in the concentration of metals such as zinc and iron in some mechanically milled fufu samples. Though from the research, uh, the estimated daily intake of metals such as zinc and iron was lower than the international food standards. There were an overindulgence in fufu may result in accumulation of these metals in the body which though are essential, may result in unwanted effects with prolonged exposure. Joy News' medical reporter, Dr. Neta Pasram, reports. One. <laughs> Fufu is a popular traditional delicacy for most Ghanaians, especially amongst the Ashanti. It is prepared from boiled cassava alone or in combination with plantain or cocoyam through pounding in a mortar with a pistol. The process of making fufu can be laborious, hence, in the spirit of technological evolution, some commercial fufu joints have opted for a faster and easier method, namely mechanically milled fufu. <laughs>
A heavy metal is any metallic substance that is poisonous at low concentrations. It can either be inherently essential or toxic. Examples include iron, zinc, lead, chromium, arsenic, and mercury. A buildup of these heavy metals in the body is associated with brain, heart, and kidney damage, among others. The research published in the International Journal of Food Contamination explored the concentrations of heavy metals in mechanically milled fufu and its potential health risk to consumers. Miss Patricia Ivy Agozo, a graduate student of the department, partook in the research. And generally, these machines are made from steel. And due to the possibility of these components leaching into the food process, and also the ability of these metals to store in our human organs, resulting in several health problems, are my reason for conducting this research. And also, I we sought to like determine the level of consumer's awareness on the potential contamination of fufu from these sources. Yes. A total of 30 milled fufu and unmilled fufu ingredients were sampled from five communities around KNUST campus in the Ashanti region. The results after laboratory analysis showed that chromium, nickel, and manganese were well below the detection limit. However, there was about 50 and 58 percent increase in iron and zinc concentrations respectively after milling. And from my results, I realized that iron and zinc concentration had increased after milling. So with this increase after milling, it's an indication that this locally fabricated mill have added some amounts of this metal as a result of friction, wear and tear of the grinding part. Although right now the concentrations were below, I believe that with time, as these same machines are being used, they could be or they could present at higher levels. Also, I also recommend regular monitoring. When it comes to food safety, there is a need to continue assessing these levels. This is an indication that mechanically milled fufu is safe for consumption within the study area. However, it is important to be cautious of overindulgence. I am Dr. Netta Pashram, reporting for Joy News. And I am Abita Siwidi with Joy News today. And up next is Dalqua with Business. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Business. My name is Darrell Kao. Deputy Minister of Energy, Andrew Japa Mesa, has hinted at an amendment to the laws to incorporate very useful provisions that will have enhance the country's local content agenda. The Deputy Minister made this known during the commissioning of an ultra-modern oil terminal by Dutilex Company Limited at Takwa in the Western region. He explains that for such industries uh, as mining and energy, where international investment is predominant, local participation is crucial, so Ghanaians reap full benefits. There's more in this report. Dutilex Company Limited, a lubricant solution company, has opened an ultra-modern terminal at Achampem, Takwa, in the Takwa and Seyu municipality to serve the extractive industry in the country. At the inaugural ceremony, the company said its main focus is on providing quality cutting edge lubricants solutions to the mining, oil, gas, marine and energy sectors. The products are also designed to meet the need of manufacturing, agriculture and construction sectors as well as users of all heavy equipment on highways vehicles. Chief Executive Officer of Dutilex Company Limited, Peter Kwam, said the company decided in the last quarter of 2021 to invest in the ultra-modern oil terminal to serve its clients with strong delivery and high sense of professionalism. Today marks the beginning of a journey that will see a dynamic change in the oil and gas industry. 
in terms of lubricants. Today we celebrate two years of hard work. Detroit's company Limited has been in existence for you know two years, as I did say, representing one of the biggest brands in lubricants in the world. Our exclusive partnership with Petrocada Lubricants is not just in Ghana, but as was said, extends to West and Central Africa. As part of our effort to provide a solution to the mining, oil and gas, and manufacturing industries, the company took the decision in the last quarter of 2021 to invest in this automotive oil terminal to serve our cherished clients with prompt delivery and high sense of professionalism. Deputy Minister of Energy Andrews Ejapa Mesa applauded the efforts of the company for getting their product to the extractive and manufacturing companies in the western and western north regions. It's significant that we are gathered here to celebrate landmark in the growth trajectory of the indigenous Ghanaian firm. The strides that it has made in this direction are nothing, nothing short of landmark. I am informed that the oil terminal that we are here to commission is meant to hold a stock level of 1 million meters of oil lubricants and is projected to provide state-of-the-art oil analysis to set business within the extractive construction and manufacturing industries. Clearly, all that GTLS company has achieved so far has come about as a result of the dedicated hard work, and I would like to congratulate the management and staff of GTLS for this journey. Celebrate your ambitious goal to get your end to end lubricant solution to the doorsteps of the extractive and manufacturing industries here within the Western and Western North regional areas. Delivering his keynote address, Ken of Asin Rinchi traditional area, Asin Kushia, Ihuna Bobrimpra, Ajin Sam the Sith, urged Kenyan companies to embrace competition in business. This is not the first Ghanaian company. And making a special appeal to all Ghanaian competitors that it is in our interest to have a rivalry competitor rather than enemies. We are not enemies. I am very proud today that this company has come all the way two, three years up to this time to launch its products in collaboration with foreign investors. The terminal will create 100 direct and 400 indirect jobs for the people of Takwa and its environs. In Athalia Kwanza, Joy News, Takwa. Now, players in the tourism sector have been charged to find innovative ways to generate revenue to grow significantly. According to Chairman of the Board of the Chamber for Tourism Industry Ghana, Dr. Prince Kofi Kujasin, players need to think critically to make the industry viable. Ghana's economy, I believe that we need to be able to really look at it, those of us who are here. Our job should not be on the old traditional tourism, but with critical thinking as to how we can be able to move this you know, forward for the country to be able to rely on this area. Our youth, you know, should be able to be encouraged, you know, that this industry is a very, very big industry, not only to travel to Dubai and back, but how do we create Dubai in all, all over the region? Should be one of our tasks, you know. So we need to move to critical thinking, you know, and see what we can do to support government efforts to move Ghana to the next level. If you look at the African Continental Trade Agreement, you realize that the reason why it's in Ghana Sometimes we are not talking about it, you know, but if you look at it, it's majority of tourism. Because people have to fly to Ghana, <laughs> you know, to see Ghana and see how you can invest. And they put their headquarters in Ghana so that they can start, you know, running Africa from here. So uh, maybe the old tourism probably ends today, you know, I believe. And then the new tourism begins. You know, maybe we need to add another name to it, you know, smart tourism or something. And the small business news coming up um, at the top of the hour on the marketplace. Up next, sports news. Good afternoon. Welcome to Showbiz here on Joy News Today. Now, entertainment critic KOD says musicians must cultivate the habit of intentionally promoting their works globally. 
uh, his comment comes at the back of conversations about how Ghanaian, Ghanaian sounds can cross the borders. I, I think it starts with being intentional about what you do. You know, um, you produce your record, you start promoting it on radio in Ghana, starts making waves. Are you content with where you are? Do you want to go beyond the Ghanaian um, um, borders? Um, finance is also an, an aspect that we can't overlook. I mean, we see uh, quite a number, a number of our brothers from Nigeria uh, other countries come here to promote their music, but how often do we intentionally decide to go out there to um, prom promote our music? It's, it's, it's pretty rare. Um, Christmas in Ghana, people are coming from different walks of life, different countries, and coming here to have fun, and not just have fun, go around, uh, uh, radio, TV stations to have interviews, and that's a subtle way of still promoting their music. We stay back home, maybe because we have a lot more gigs back home um, compared to other people and <laughs> wherever they are coming from. But we rarely go out there to intentionally promote our music. And like it's been said earlier, um, when we're out there, what kind of audience are we playing to? Are we playing to the Ghanaian audience, or we make an effort to? to um, um, appeal to an international uh, uh, audience. audience. Yeah, that's, that's, those are the things we, we need to look at. I mean, Ebu Taylor, for instance, I, I know for a fact that he doesn't work with uh, uh, local uh, event promoters. Away from KOD, congratulations are in order for Ghanaian musician Kidi as he has been nominated at the 2022 NAACP Image Awards. Kidi, who recently announced an Indigo 2 concert together with his label mate Kwame Yuji, grabbed a nomination in the outstanding international song of his Golden Boy album, Kidi Touch It. Uh, which became a global smash hit, making it to the Billboard charts, competes with other songs from other great African artists, including Whiskey, Omale, Tiwa Savage, and Fireboy DML. The NAACP Image Awards is an annual award ceremony presented by the U.S.-based National Association for Advancement of Colored People to earn outstanding performances in film, television, uh, theatre, music and literature. This year's edition will be held on Sunday, 27th February, 2022. Way from Kitty singer, songwriter Sonti Indambela says she's been hugely impacted by legendary Hugh Masakela and Maria Makiba after working with them for nine years. Speaking to Joy News, the musician recounts her over three decades musical journey. On that note, we end showbiz here on Joy News today. My name is Becky. Over to you, Mabs. And my name is Mapita Sibiri, and that's how we end Joy News today. For more news, you can log to myjoyonline.com. Thank you so much for your company and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.